special edition of Eye on the Isles. It's a playoff preview here. I'm Aiden Northcott alongside a guy who needs no introduction. Uh, one of the voices of Fair Isle, Fort Isles Radio and Ocean 100 Saturday Night Hockey, Corey Arsenault. Corey, thanks for joining me here. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Usually I'm the guy asking the questions, so it's, uh, it's nice to uh, be on the other side of the, the coin. Well, then we won't uh, waste any more time here. We'll just get right into it. So uh, the Isles uh, obviously had a great weekend to cap off the regular season. Started fourth, uh, got it wrapped up fourth in the Eastern Conference with a big gutsy come from behind win against the Halifax Mooseheads on national TV uh, on Sportsnet there. Uh, overall, would you say, you know, one of the best performances of the season for the Islanders, especially when they needed it? Yeah, I would think. I mean, uh, you know, Destiny was in their own hands. Uh, the loss uh, Friday night against Moncton was a tough one. Uh, they had a tremendous start in that first period against Moncton. Then all of a sudden the Wildcats uh, turned it up a notch. The Islanders had opportunities on the power play, but uh, were unable to come through, but they were they were happy about their game on Friday night, and I think they carried some of those positives into the game in Halifax. Uh, not an easy place to win, sold out crowd, 10,500 national TV game. You need a point to play Cape Breton. You need two points for home ice, and uh, they didn't have a great start. It would, they were down two nothing, ten minutes into the hockey game, and a lot of scoreboard watching going on uh, from myself included, wondering uh, where we could end up here this weekend. But uh, you know that second period, I'm not sure what was said during the first intermission. But uh, Jim Holton spun something off, and, and they came out and, and competed, and, and they took it to Halifax in that middle frame, and, and then uh, you know <clears throat> were able to to take it to overtime, taking that penalty late. I'm thinking this is destiny. Uh, Halifax is going to score on the power play, and we're going to be on a bus going to Bay Camo. But uh, thankfully, Halifax played for that point. Two key faceoff wins by Brett Budgel and Nikita Alexandrov to kill off that penalty late, and uh, a total team effort. But Matthew Welsh uh, was outstanding like he has been all season long and he's a big part of why this team has been so successful and uh, he's been our best player all year and he certainly was on, on Saturday afternoon when the when the Islanders needed him the most. Yeah, no kidding. He was definitely uh, one of the best players and as you mentioned, been the MVP for this team all season and it's funny that you mentioned scoreboard watching. I know we were all doing it back here in Charlottetown too, watching that scoreboard, seeing who we were playing and one of those teams we were watching obviously was the Cape Breton Screaming Eagles who the Islanders will play in this first round. It's a team that a uh, bit of an easier schedule for them down the road, but ultimately won the games they needed to, uh, including two back-to-back -back victories against Bathurst here this week. Yeah, I mean, everybody knew that, uh, I think, after we left Cape Breton uh, two weekends ago, that six points were, were on their, their plate for the taking, a game against St. John and, and a game against Bathurst. And if you want to be playing some of your best hockey going into the playoffs, you better pick up those points. And they got the job done. Uh, the Islanders always knew all the way along that the back end of their schedule was going to be tough. But, uh, you know, the drive for fourth place really started at the Christmas. Christmas trade deadline, uh, you know, it made the the regular season so exciting uh, for a lot of teams because it came down to that last game. But the job the players have done since coming in from the trade deadline uh, has been outstanding. You look at Jordan Marr, you look at uh, Xavier Bernard, two guys that left contending teams to come here to Charlottetown, and, and that's not an easy for any junior hockey player. Marr went through it last year with the Memorial Cup. There's a reason why these guys are at that level, and because they want to win. So when you're leaving a top team to come down to a team that's you know lower in, in the in the standings, uh, they took it like pros, and they came out here. And hats off to those those two guys. Uh, the team didn't miss a beat. Actually, they played better after the trades were made for the first couple weeks. You know, there's peaks and valleys throughout every regular season, but at the end of the day, uh, it was the veterans that uh, you know really pulled the way here. And I thought Bernard was was terrific down the stretch, and, and Jordan Mars just brought a consistent effort game in and game out. So you know, you look out through the second half of the season, the comeback win in Gatineau at the back end of three and three when you give up a goal with a minute and a half to left. Lucas Cormier ties it up. Then he wins it in overtime. You know, it, It's easy to look at the points that you gave away, but you got to look at the, the wins and, and the way things were done. If the Islanders don't win uh, two games in Cape Breton two weekends ago, we're not even talking about home ice here right now. They're probably packing the bus to go to Quebec. So this team uh, pulled, uh, pulled it out all the way through and, and hats off. I mean, on paper, meat doesn't mean much once you get on the ice and you have that heart and the de determination. Uh, it goes a long way and, and this team's been fun to watch here once again this season. And we'll obviously get into uh, Xavier Bernard and Jordan Meyer and those guys uh, as we go along here. But we'll focus first uh, in Cape Breton and look at them offensively. They're led, uh, led by a guy that Islanders fans are pretty familiar with. He had another career year in goals coming off of a 42-goal performance last season. Turned into 43 this year. Finished the season with 82 points, leading the Cape Breton Screaming Eagles. Former Charlottetown Islander Mitchell Bomas. You know, he's the guy that 
probably stirs the drink there offensively for Cape Breton. No, 100%. A fantastic talent. Uh, former first-round pick here in Charlottetown. Uh, the kid can score. That's all he's done all his life. Uh, great kid off the ice, first and foremost. And he's going to get his points. Uh, he's a tough guy to key in on. Uh, there's a reason why Cape Breton paid a hefty price for him because he's a premier sniper, not only in the queue, but in the Canadian Hockey League. Uh, he's a winner now as well uh, with the rings and the, the championship uh, run last year with Bathurst. So he's a guy the Islanders definitely have to key in on. Uh, you know, this Cape Breton team's a little bit more veteran team. Uh, up front, uh, you'd have to give them the edge uh, with with talent up front but talent only goes so far uh, you got to work hard and this Islanders team works hard but you look at Cape Breton uh, you know Mitch Balmas uh, Derek Gentile we know what he's all about uh, he can put points up Matthias Laferriere St. Louis Blues pick uh, he's pretty crafty Igor Sokolov uh, you know he's a guy that when he's on uh, not many players can stop him uh, six foot four 220 pounds and then they got some real good depth guys Sean Boudreaux has come in uh, you know he, another former Islander when he gets things wound up, I know he's coming back from an injury. Uh, he has a chance to take a game over. Declan Smith is a guy that's been hurt as well, but uh, he has the ability to take over a game as well. He plays that uh, throwback old school. I love, I love his game. I love what he brings to the table. He's a heart and soul type player in Cape Breton. So I mean, you look up and down throughout that lineup, pretty daunting. Uh, you know, then you got Ryan Francis and, and Brooklyn Kalmakov, two of the top 17-year-olds in the queue. Although Francis doesn't get the ice time uh, nearly as much as as what his skill probably should have but you know and then they got some key players Isaiah Campbell you know they got a good team but uh, the one thing that can neutralize them here in Charlottetown is the back end the Islanders back end is is very strong one through six and then uh, goaltending uh, nobody matches up like like Matthew Welsh does against any offense. All right, now looking at that uh, Islanders offense, we were led here in Charlottetown by another 20-year-old ourselves, uh, another guy coming off of a career year, 34 goals, 44 assists. Uh, Daniel Hardy, big 20-year-old year with 78 points. Uh, we talk about how Balmester is the drink. You can say the same about Daniel Hardy here. Well, you're right. I think he's one of the more uh, underappreciated players in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League, a great plus-minus as well. Uh, he takes care of things on both ends of the ice. When Daniel Hardy's feet are moving, he's a terrific hockey player. Uh, a sniper. He went on a stretch there for about two and a half months where he was, you know, hanging with the big dogs. He was right there just below goal scoring and uh, a terrific pickup by Jim Holton and, and staff. And Daniel's a great guy too. I mean, uh, he has the ability to snipe and when he's doing so, uh, the Islanders win, I think, 10 power play goals on the season. So, you know, Daniel Hardy's going to have to have a big playoffs here for the Islanders moving forward. you got to lean on your 20-year-olds. Daniel Hardy is, is the top scorer and he's going to have to be the top scorer. And, you know, they need other guys to take the pressure off as well. Nikita Alexandrov, who went through a rough funk. Nice to see him score one in Halifax uh, on a goaltender here heading into the playoffs. I mean, he had a terrific uh, first half of the season. Uh, it's not easy to be consistent in major junior hockey, especially for, for younger players, and especially in the draft here, lots of pressure on them. Brett Budgel, 18 goals. I mean, everybody wanted more to Brett Budgel, but at the end of the day, 18 or, or 19 goals in and around that is, is a pretty good year for a 17-year-old. Everybody thinks players can take that next step because of what we've seen in the playoffs last year. That's not how it works. Uh, you know, other teams start keying in on you more and more. So, you know, the Islanders have offense spread through the top six. Hopefully Thomas Casey can get back to, to where he was before he went down with the injury. It was nice to see him get two games in before, but he wasn't quite at his peak level. When he's going, there's not many faster in the queue. Kevin Gersoy, they, they're going to need him to step up and play play some big minutes here as well. You know, up and down, but it's been the bottom six that have really helped the Islanders kind of solidify things. Zach Beauregard's turned into a, a star here in Charlottetown as far as we're concerned with uh, his compete level and, and effort. I mean, nobody works harder than Zach Beauregard on the ice. Cole Edwards has come to play. You know, these guys uh, up and down, Liam Payton, I mean, the list can go on and on. But for this Islanders team, up front, they're going to need a full full team effort and uh, goal scoring up and down throughout the lineup. And this isn't a skilled team. Jim Holton will tell you that right off the bat. They're going to have to go to the net, look for greasy goals. If they get into a skills competition with Cape Breton, it's not going to last very long. You're right, and it's funny that you mentioned, you know, that uh, you know the playoff performances and how you build team players can build off the playoff performances. One player who did that though this year was Nikita Alexandrov, a guy who had a pretty quiet season uh, last year. People had questions about, you know, is this guy the real deal? And then all of a sudden he comes on a little bit in the second half of the regular season in 17-18, puts in a massive, massive performance in the playoffs. He is one of those guys that's really built off of that performance and been one of the uh, premier players this year for the Islanders with 27 goals. Well, he had a good summer and uh, you know that's first and foremost the hockey 
hockey season will end here in, in the near future, and it's what you do when you leave the rink that that prepares you for the for the following season. And when Nikita came back, I seen him at Fox Meadow during the Islanders golf tournament. He didn't take part in the golf tournament, but he was sitting there and he had a big summer and uh, put on some 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 muscle and, and leaned out. And you know, for any player coming into the league, uh, it takes 30 plus games to get accustomed. And the first half of the season last year wasn't a great one for Nikita Alexandrov. Then all of a sudden, he had a hat trick in Sherbrooke. Uh, he went home for home cooking, was able to reset, and he came back a different player. You know, and that goes for anybody, whether or not it's a European or rookie or free agent coming in. Yeah, very few step in and make an impact right off the bat. But uh, Nikita, you know, had the scouts flocking in here to Charlottetown. I'm sure uh, he probably wasn't uh, overly pleased with the last 15 or 16 games when he went on a bit of a goalless streak. But the shots were still there. The assists were still there. The puck just wasn't going in for him. And it's just a matter of time for, for a skilled player like Nikita. And that's why I say it's nice to see him get that one. You could tell it was like a, a monkey lifted off his back when he scored that big goal against Alexi Gravel to tie the hockey game up at two and give the Islanders a fighting chance for home so, I mean, he's a key player. He has a chance to take over a game. He's going to have to be on top of his game here this weekend. And now looking at the back end, you mentioned how the Islanders might have the advantage here on the back end defensively, and that is led by another 20-year-old, Hunter Drew, uh, second in the league among all defensemen in goals, uh, one of the top 10 defenders in points. He turned in probably one of his be best performances of the season uh, against Halifax on Saturday. Yeah, Hunter Drew. I mean, uh, I love the guy. I know uh, a lot of people might be hard on him at, at times, but uh, he shows up. He shows up to play and take Hunter Drew out of this team. It's a totally different uh, look on the back end. Keeps the opposition uh, very honest and 16 goals. That's a pretty good uh, season. I mean, uh, he competes uh, shift in and shift out. He's going to turn pucks over. Everybody's going to turn pucks over. It's a matter of, uh, you know, being smart with the puck. And, and, you know, Hunter sometimes tries to get a little fancy. But, uh, you know, when, when, when it's time to go, he's going to be there. I got no, no qualms about where Hunter Drew will be here in this playoff series. I mean, uh, the poster child for free agents coming here to Charlottetown. Uh, talk about second opportunities, came down, made the most of it two years ago. He wasn't even playing at this time. He was the healthy scratch, put the work in last year, an NHL draft pick, and uh, and now a 20-year-old. He's fighting for a contract, so he's got to have a big big playoffs here uh, for Anaheim to take notice. I mean, uh, a good second half of the season here. At times, it was off, but that's 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 everybody. And uh, you know, he that game in 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 Halifax on Saturday afternoon, he set the tone early. Durando, Aslan, he just gave it to them every shift. I mean, every shift, every shift, physical tone. He has the ability to be very effective, and, and the Islanders, they'll need him uh, leading the charge on the back end. You mentioned how great of a season 16 goals is, especially for a 20-year-old. How about 15 goals for a 16-year-old? Lucas Cormier turned in an unbelievable performance this season in his first year in the queue. Those 15 goals actually are the 10th most in Canadian Hockey League history by a 16-year-old defenseman, beating players the likes of Raymond Bork, who only had 12 as a 16-year-old. Uh, but he's been a big part of this back end, as much as Hunter Drew has, and he's really developed some great chemistry with another former Cape Breton Screaming Eagle player, defenseman Noah Lowen, who came over in that Derek Gentile trade. Yeah, Lucas Cormier, uh, you know, thank God St. John didn't go an hour and a half down the road <laughs> with that second overall pick. Um, you know, he's been... Uh, everything he can ask for more. I mean, everybody knew he had this offensive side uh, to his game, uh, but I don't think anybody knew it was going to come this early. Uh, you know, he's a guy that at times, you know, he could he could run the power play for a full two minutes. Uh, he takes a pounding out there, but uh, his defensive play is, is what impressed me more than than his offensive side. We knew about his offensive side, and you're right, 15 goals is is nothing to sneeze at. I mean, you're talking, uh, you know, up there and in the record books, and he could have had 20 easily here. I mean, the one thing about Cormier, you watch him play, rarely does his shot get blocked. He lets it go, he finds a lane. It's always about, you know, 24 inches off the ice, so it's not hitting a skate or a stick on the way through. His hockey IQ is off the charts, but he competes defensively. And, you know, when I first keyed in on him was uh, when Ramuski was in town and uh, Alexi Lafreniere was coming in one-on-one. -on -one. And you're talking about one of the best players in Canada. And Cormier, with his, his active stick and his, his foot movement, was able to stay with him and not give up an inch. So, I mean, he's a guy that uh, goes into the corner. He'll battle. You know, size isn't an issue with him because he doesn't play like he's five foot. Uh, 
uh, eight. He plays like he's, he's six feet, and he can he can withstand the rigors of, of the physical play. And no allowance come in. What a, what a great uh, pickup he has been. I mean, he just kind of solidifies that back end with, with Cormier. And, I mean, this is the future uh, on the back end. This back end, most of it's coming back next year for the exception of, of Hunter Drew. But Cormier and Lowen have been a treat to watch. And, and you know, no one talks about Brendan Clavel and what he brings to the table. He was outstanding. He's uh, a leader on this team, blocks shots, does a lot of little things that don't get noticed. He doesn't put up the points, but he's one of the guys that, you know, when you're trying to kill a penalty, when you're trying to win a hockey game late, he's the guy that's going to win you games. And then, and then you know, you go by that, you got the luxury of having Xavier Bernard on your third pairing. And he's kind of played with a different partner in and out here. But, uh, you know, over the last three weeks, Bernard has really, really elevated his game. And he looks like an NHL pick out there. And that's the luxury of having a deep back end is having a guy like Bernard paired up with either Dersch or, or Vanden Herc. So, you know, this Islanders back end moving forward is as offensive as Cape Breton is. The back end, if they can keep things uh, simple and moving pucks out and, and, you know, playing smart in their back end, uh, I like the matchup. And now looking at Cape Breton's back end, they're obviously led to by uh, another guy who had some pretty gaudy goal totals. Leon Gavanke led the league among all defensemen, 17 goals, uh, 57 points this year, third among all defensemen. Uh, we talk about you know how strong and how your best defensemen need to be your best defenseman. He's going to need to be that here for uh, for Cape Breton in the wake of uh, potentially some pretty uh, pretty crucial injuries. Well, you're right, uh, Antoine Crepazil is is their is their number one guy. I mean, uh, Gavanke's there, but they they play uh, Crepazil a ton. He's important to that team and he's out with an injury he didn't play down the regular season so it'll be interesting to see. If they're missing him, it's a totally different ball game on the back end for Cape Breton but Gavanke's a guy, fourth round pick Winnipeg Jets, I mean the uh, the makeup is there for a pro hockey player and he can skate he can wheel he can do a little bit of everything but he needs some support and uh, Crepazil provides that support if he's not there to support him then all of a sudden things get a little thin on the back end but they got guys that can step up as well I mean uh, you go through their back end and, and, and take a look around and, and see what they have uh, they go out and get a guy like LaRose they go out and get Sandalins these are, are grit and sandpaper type guys that I think will elevate their game come playoff time but Crepazil is the key here uh, you know, for this Cape Breton team, Havlin is a guy that has some has some grit in his game as well. But uh, if Krepazil is missing, and I'm sure he'll, I'm sure he'll probably be, should be in the lineup. The Islanders will have to try to key in in him. And anytime you get a chance to finish the check, you want to play physical on both uh, any of their back end. You want to get in, get pucks deep, get in on the four check, and that's when pucks start to get turned over if they start to feel the pressure. But uh, Gavanke is a guy that's going to see a, a ton of ice time. But Krepazil is is the key here for the Screaming Eagles in this series. And now you talk about injuries. We mentioned Krep Elzeal, uh, the Screaming Eagles, obviously dealing with a couple other key injuries. We mentioned it earlier, Declan Smith, Sean Baudrillard, a couple of uh, very important pieces in their top six. Luckily for the Islanders, though, they're getting healthy at the right time. They get Thomas Casey back. Uh, they get Kevin Gersoy, Drew Johnson come back at the start of March. Will Sermon looks like he's not far away. Could be in the lineup this weekend. No official word yet from Jim. But uh, obviously, this is, uh, this is the time of year to get healthy. And it's you know if, if these guys are injured for Cape Breton, that's that's a serious changing uh, you know serious changing event. Well, key guys, uh, there's no denying that. But there's no team that's healthy this time of the year as well. I mean, you're going into to game 69, or if you're if you're Noah Lowen, game 70 for him, as he played 69 regular season games. But there's nicks and bruises, uh, the infirmaries on both sides. The athletic therapist Kevin Elliott, he'd have a parade going through. Same thing in Cape Breton. I mean, uh, it's a long grinding season. There's bumps and bruises, and now all of a sudden the intensity gets ratcheted up here, uh, half a dozen notches. So. Uh, uh, you know, if you're bumps and bruises, that's not going to heal. It's time for the adrenaline to take over. And, and you're right on the Islander side. It's nice to see Thomas Casey back. I mean, such a key part of this team here. Uh, a terrific uh, second year here with with the Islanders. And then you look at uh, a guy like Will Sermon. You know, he's a he's a, a character piece, uh, a piece of the puzzle that you can trust, lean on. He was playing good hockey before he went down with that injury. But I know I talked to him in Halifax. He's hoping to be to be ready to go uh, this weekend, and if not, sometime in this series. And then on the Cape Breton side. I mean, Boudreau returned to the lineup, so sounds like uh, he'll play, but uh, the other two would be Smith and, and Basil and, and huge parts of their team. And now looking back on the ice, looking in particular in goal, and what might be the most important matchup of this series, you have Matthew Welsh, the Islanders' undisputed most valuable player on the ice and off the ice, and you look at the Cape Breton end, you have Kevin Mandelize, the Ottawa Senators pick, guy who's 
totals, you know, save percentage is a little bit down, but a guy who, when he's on, he is on. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm waiting for him to, to string it together with some consistency. And, uh, you know, when I first seen this kid come in at 16 years old, I'm thinking this could be a second round pick in the NHL. I mean, you talk about size, athleticism, uh, you know, he's got the skill. He's got it all, but it's about putting it together. And Matthew Welsh has found how to put it together, and he's had it together for a long time. I mean, uh, the consistent play of Matthew Welsh is is uh, second to none. I mean, uh, we've had some great goaltenders here in Charlottetown. Uh, I've been here since year one. Some real good goaltenders, some on the wall here behind us, uh, Antoine Bibeau, Ryan, Mo Ryan Muir, Evan Mosier, Bobby Nadeau, Max Legacy. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on, but uh, none of them have been the Mason McDonald. None of them have been at this level of, of Matthew Welsh. And, you know, it started in the summer for him to be identified by Hockey Canada as one of uh, the four top goaltenders for his age. And, you know, he's really uh, built off that playoff run into this season. He's played a lot, uh, you know, down the stretch. And that, that had a reason why Dakota Long Corners an opportunity to move because nobody's playing over Matthew Welsh. If he could play all 68, he'd play. And uh, But you got to give him a little break here, here now and then. But he's played, I think, 14 straight down the stretch. And, you know, make no bones about it, uh, Matthew Welsh, this team's going to go as far as Matthew Welsh will carry them. We know his shoulders are strong. He took uh, the Islanders on quite a run last year, and I know he's certainly up to the task again this year. And on the opposite side of things, you know, Mandelize has, has yet to prove himself. So it's a big playoff series for him. Uh, you know, he has the ability, the size, but, uh, you know, with, with the win two weekends ago, Mandelize and both games, uh, the Islanders have to be feeling good about themselves and their games against Mandelize here this year. And now looking one more final, uh, obviously matchup is not so much on the ice, but off the ice and in behind the benches. Uh, two coaches very familiar with each other, Jim Holton, Marc-Andre Dumont. They were assistant coaches for Team Canada at the this past World Junior Championships. Uh, obviously we talk here in Charlottetown in particular just about how important Jim Holton's been to this team and how he's gotten the most out of his uh, players on the ice. Uh, this is a matchup here that is going to go fly under the radar but the way that the, these two coaches utilize their talent and utilize the players to their best advantage is going to be something to watch. Well yeah you're right and, and you know Jim everybody knows the job that he's done here in Charlottetown except maybe the people handing out the awards but uh, you know he's been fantastic. He's he's taken a team that probably shouldn't peak to where, where it's gone and been able to get it to the next level and that's a sign of uh, a real good coach uh, you know uh, shrewd trades I mean uh, not many teams sold their three best players and still ended up with 40 wins and home ice advantage so that speaks uh, you know numbers for itself I mean he's got a good support staff around him as well and, and Jim doesn't like the spotlight but uh, he's done a terrific job here in Charlottetown you know and then Mark Andre I like Mark Andre he's a, a former media guy he's great uh, with the media out there he, you know he's 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 more than willing to to share his time with you, but he's under under some pressure in Cape Breton. Uh, the last two years, Cape Breton sold the best player in the league, Dubois and Batherson, and their patient, their fans are going a little bit patient over there. New ownership in here as well. I mean, you don't like to say he's coaching for his job, but uh, we've seen what happened to Jim Midgley last year with expectations. There's those same type of expectations on the Cape Breton side. So, you know, Mark Andre Dumas has some work to do. He he made some key moves to bring guys in. Now it's whether or not they respond to to what. Uh, he wants to get done but uh, you know a key matchup and you know one thing about Jim and coaching staff it's their their ability to adjust to the things uh, in game uh, you can really notice from off the ice and you know they'll be prepared uh, there won't be a, a team that's better prepared than the Islanders going in and uh, for Mark Andre uh, he's he's scratching here trying to get by uh, he definitely needs a series win to, to keep moving on and uh, we'll wait and see how the cards play out but you know Jim's proved it time and time again he's taken the team to the second round the last four years the only team uh, in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League to have that feat and for a for a franchise and organization that struggled for for so long and I know because I've been here since year one it's certainly been uh, a pleasure and a treat to watch and looking for more of the same here uh, this this kick at the can yeah you mentioned Jim Holton and about how important he's been to this team four times in the PEI Rocket and Charlton Islanders history have they achieved 40 wins in the regular season Jim Holton's been behind the bench for two of those runs so now Wrapping up here, Corey, uh, we've talked all about you know the offense, the defense, behind the bench, in net. 
What are the keys to success for the Islanders to move on in round one? Well, I mean, uh, it's it's an old uh, adage, but special teams and goaltending, and it's not rocket science. And the other thing is, you know, home ice. You got to take advantage of the last change and set the tone here early. Uh, you know, the Islanders are going to need uh, not just one guy. I mean, obviously Matt Welsh is the guy, but they're going to need everybody pulling here. I mean, this Cape Breton team is is stacked up on paper, and uh, you know they're chomping at the bit and ready to go. They're beatable. But uh, you better be uh, be on top of your game and, you know, playing whistle to whistle, taking care of the, of the details and, and puck management. But uh, they're going to need a full team effort. You take shifts off uh, any time in the regular season. If you take them off in the playoffs, it's going to be tough to win. And I'm, I'm excited. I mean, I think this is this is the matchup the Islanders were looking for. This is uh, uh, an opponent that the Islanders, I think, can, can handle. Not with ease, but they can handle. The regular season has showed it. I think the confidence of winning two over in Cape Breton two weekends ago, uh, you know, will go a long way in that room to knowing that they can get it done on the road but you got to take care of, of your own home cooking here first and if they're able to do that I like their chances. Tickets for game one and game two here at the East Link Center are available still at the East Link Center box office by phone at 902-629-6625 or online at boxoffice.eastlinkcenterpei. Corey thanks so much for joining me. Signing off for Corey Arsenal here I'm Aiden Northcott and this has been Eye on the Isles.